I'm Dr. David Steinhaus, Medical Director, Vice President, and General Manager for the Heart Failure Business at Medtronic. I'm really excited for tonight's Global Grand Rounds event, which is focused on an exciting new technology which will improve the CRT response in many of your patients. It's called Adaptive CRT, and for the very first time, I think we can say we've significantly improved the response rate for CRT. We will hear from two physicians tonight who have done extensive research on biventricular pacing and right ventricular pacing, as well as the effects on heart failure patients. Our first speaker is Dr. Daniel Luskarten, electrophysiologist and associate professor from the University of Vermont, Fletcher Allen Medical Center in Burlington, Vermont. Physiologic pacing is one of Dr. Luskarten's academic interests, and he played an important role in the initial stages of the development of this adaptive CRT algorithm. Dr. Luskarten will be speaking on the science behind the adaptive CRT algorithm, as well as the clinical data to support its benefits. It really is truly an honor and a pleasure to have uh, the opportunity to describe for you this evening how the adaptive CRT algorithm works. The beauty of, of this algorithm that distinguishes it from other currently available algorithms is the fact that there actually are scientific underpinnings for uh, the parameters that have been built into it. Now, the subject matter is fairly dense, and I'm going to attempt to make it as intuitive uh, and cool as possible. Uh, I find this stuff to be very enjoyable, and hopefully you will too. Um, so just taking a step back for a moment, uh, we all, I think, at this point uh, in the history of, of biventricular pacing and cardiac resynchronization therapy agree that this is a treatment really for left bundle branch block. Data going back all the way to, for example, made it CRT clearly exemplify that the advantages to be gleaned from biventricular pacing occur in the context of patients who have left bundle branch block as demonstrated in the upper left-hand corner of this Kaplan-Meier uh, graph, which shows that the only significant improvement in congestive heart failure and hospitalization incidence is actually obtained in that patient subgroup. Let's look uh, a little bit more closely at this. So um, in this picture, on the uh, upper portion of it, you can see normal activation timing of the right ventricle and left ventricle in cross-section. And what you can see is that the entire timing of the heart is completed within 80 milliseconds or so. Um, however, below that picture, we see an example of left bundle branch block, where now the lateral wall of the left ventricle is being activated 140 milliseconds later. The important thing to remember is that the left ventricle does not exist in isolation. There's also a right ventricle. And in the right ventricle, as you can see here, the timing is completely preserved by virtue of the fact that the right ventricle is being activated via Hisperkinji tissue, which is rapidly conducting, as opposed to ventricular myocytes, which conduct very slowly. So in pure left bundle branch block, electrical activation of the posterior lateral segment of the LV free wall is significantly delayed, while activation of the RV is preserved. This is a picture of sinus rhythm in somebody who has normal conduction. What you can see is the impulse being generated from the right atrium, coming down through the AV node, rapidly going through the Hisperkinji uh, fascicles, and then you can see the parallel activation of the right ventricle and left ventricle. With the left bundle branch block, you still get rapid conduction through the right bundle, but now look at the delayed activation of the left ventricle via the septum by a ventricular myocyte spread. This is the problem that we're contending with in the setting of cardiac resynchronization. Now the question is that if the RV is being activated normally via Hisperkinji tissue and via the right bundle branch block, well, why pace the right ventricle at all? Do you really need RV pacing? Dave Cass did some fascinating studies on this back in the late 90s that I think are quite revealing. This is a study where they looked at 18 patients this is a single patient that we're looking at. But basically, they performed pressure volume loops using a Millar catheter in the left ventricle using different pacing configurations. And these were all patients who had left bundle branch block and cardiomyopathy, as well as preserved conduction and with normal rates, rates less than 100 beats per minute. What you can see here is that the solid line is demonstrating baseline conduction, and the dashed line is pacing, in this case, from the RV apex and from the RV septum. In neither of these cases is there any big change in the stroke volume as represented by the area within the curve of the pressure volume loop. Generally speaking, it was either the same or worse when you were RV apically pacing or RV septally pacing in these patients. 
What was consistent, however, again, in this patient population, was that during biventricular pacing, again, looked at, look at the dashed line pressure volume loop, you could see that it's much, the area is much larger, hence stroke volume is greatly improved in that scenario. This is the same patient with left ventricular free wall pacing, and in fact, you even get a larger response. So here's a case under these particular circumstances where left ventricular free wall pacing is in fact better. In this study, Dr. Cass and his colleagues also noted that there was a proportional response with respect to the form of pacing and the QRS duration at baseline. So patients who, who had a very, very wide QRS at, at baseline under baseline conduction um, were if you would, uh, I guess you could put it, we're super responders. So if you look at QRS greater than 200 milliseconds, you see a percentage increase in DPDT uh, approaching 75% improvement. The solid squares are patients that are receiving left ventricular free wall pacing only, and you can get the sense that the LV free wall was in fact particularly robust in this patient population. They concluded on the basis of these ob observations that single site pacing at the site of greatest delay achieves similar or greater benefits to biventricular patient, uh, pacing in patients with left bundle branch block, preserved AV conduction, at resting heart rates. Additionally, they also identified another uh, uh, parameter of relevance, which was that there was a sweet spot in terms of AV, programmed AV delay. If you programmed a very long AV delay, well, basically, you're going to be achieving native conduction, predominantly all right bundle activation, and you don't see much change in DPDT. If you, sh if you program a very, very short um, uh, AV delay, whether you do it with biventricular pacing or LV pacing, again, you see no change or a detrimental effect on DPDT. There's a sweet spot between those extremes where you get optimal um, uh, response. Well, why is that? Around the same time, Van Gelder and colleagues did essentially an identical uh, study, but they added on to that looking at the morphology of the paced QRS. And what they found is the following. On the right side of the screen, you see an AV delay that's programmed at 30 milliseconds. So in this case, the, from the sensing in the A to the pace from the LV at the free wall, basically what you're getting is left bundle branch block uh, uh, pattern. So you're getting complete activation via the LV over to, to the right. I'm sorry, it's a right bundle branch block pattern. So if you then go extend out the AV delay further and further, all of a sudden you see a change in morphology. That change in morphology correlated very well with optimal response. So basically what they're showing here is fusion of RV activation via the right bundle and LV activation via the LV paste stimulus. So LV pace timing to fuse with intrinsic conduction improved LV contractile function significantly better. And in this case, they actually showed that that was the reason it was better than biventricular pacing. Again, they were looking, as David Cass was looking at, they were looking at patients in sinus rhythm with left bundle branch block and preserved AV conduction. Another study uh, more recently looked at RV function. So basically using Millar catheter uh, transducing in the right ventricle. And during bi-V pacing, as you shorten the AV interval, you got more and more right ventricular activation via right ventricular pacing, you start to compromise the output in the right ventricle. In the left ventricle, in, rather with left ventricular pacing only, you never see compromise of, of right ventricular function. This is likely very important to response, or we would anticipate that. So, the observed benefit of LV pacing with fusion served as the underpinnings for what became the adaptive CRT algorithm, an important component of which, in fact, I would argue a, a central component of which, is that the timing of the LV stimulus fusing with LV activation with intrinsic conduction down the right bundle is the critical parameter. Let's look at this a little bit more carefully and, and think about how the algorithm works. So this is demonstrating what native conduction looks like with left bundle branch block. We're sensing in the device from the atrial lead, in, the, in this case in the atrial appendage, I don't recommend putting your leads in, that, in the appendage, by the way, but that's another story. Um, but in this case, you see the um, catheter in the appendage, or the atrial pacing lead in the uh, appendage, and an RV catheter down at the RV apex. What's happening in this case is that you're activating the right ventricular free wall via the right bundle system. Okay, so you go through the right bundle, and then you have ventricular myocyte spread. 
If you were to pace in a triggered mode to that RV sense stimulus at the end of your RV lead, well, essentially, and, and then pace from the LV lead coincidentally with the RV sense, basically you get no change. You have virtually no fusion in the complex, if that were the case. So it's critical to appreciate that what we're talking about with the adaptive CRT algorithm is a non-triggered mode that's based on, on data uh, that I'll show in a minute that optimizes the AV delay so that, in fact, you get fusion from LV activation and right bundle activation of the right ventricle. As you pre-excite the left ventricle with respect to the, when the RV was sensed, well, all of a sudden you're going to see fusion of left ventricular myocyte spread via LV pace activation with right bundle activation of the right ventricle. So what you can appreciate from these, these figures, if you look very carefully, is that you're starting to see more and more of the left ventricle coming from that paced artifact. Now we're going to move it 90 milliseconds earlier, and indeed you'll see even more left ventricular activation. And even earlier, and all of a sudden this isn't so good anymore, because basically what you're creating is right bundle branch block pattern. Now the right ventricle is activating predominantly via ventricular spread from the left ventricular stimulus. So the sweet spot is between those extremes. So how does the adaptive CRT algorithm work? <clears throat> the first thing that the algorithm does is it asks, is the patient in regular rhythm? If the patient's in regular rhythm, it will evaluate the intrinsic conduction, and we can talk a little bit about that um, perhaps during the, the question answer session. So it evaluates the intrinsic conduction between the A-sense and the RV-sense, and if that is less than 200 milliseconds, or less than 250 milliseconds during A-paced RV-sense, it will activate the LV, the adaptive CRT LV-only pacing algorithm. So basically what it will then do is pace the LV, and it paces the LV at 70% of the intrinsic AV delay. That is an empirically derived optimal um, uh, uh, timing. If, on the other hand, those conditions are not met, in other words, the AV delay is over 200 milliseconds, well, then all of a sudden the device will then switch to a biventricular pacing mode only. Now, the adaptive bi-V pacing mode is not standard bi-V pacing. It does two things. One thing is that it predicates the AV delay such that the stimulus is mandated to begin at least 30 milliseconds after the P wave, thus avoiding curtailing atrial contraction with ventricular contraction, but it occurs at least 50 milliseconds before RV sensing, thereby ensuring that you don't get fusion, uh, unintended fusion, with right ventricular activation. And that's what this diagram is demonstrating. That is the algorithm. This is what it would look like in real time. So this is a patient, uh, imagine, who's going, uh, all of a sudden, the AV delay is, is interpreted and so shown to be 190 milliseconds, so it goes into adaptive LV mode. So you can see it's A sense and LV pacing only. The right ventricle is being activated via the right bundle. Every minute, the algorithm sweeps the AV interval, and in this case, it just noted that the AV interval went beyond 210 milliseconds. So now it switches to adaptive bi V, and the patient is getting bi V paced according to the dictates that I just described with respect to the AV interval and the um, V to V timing. Every assumption that's built into this algorithm is based on empiric findings in which acute hemodynamic benefits have been demonstrated. That's true for limiting the LV only pacing for heart rate less than 100 beats per minute and intrinsic AV conduction to less than 200 milliseconds. It's true for the fact for the mandate that the pacing LV only occurs at 70% of the sensed AV interval. The assumption of pacing the bi V 30 milliseconds after the end of the P wave, but at least 50 milliseconds in advance of the RV sense, has also been de demonstrated empirically, as has timing of LV or RV pre excitation on the basis of device measured AV interval and QRS duration. In addition to these facts, this is the only automated AV optimization algorithm that has demonstrated clinical benefit in a controlled randomized double blind trial. So uh, our center actually participated in this quite large trial uh, called Adaptive CRT in which we enrolled 522 patients, I mean, not my center alone, all the centers together enrolled 522 patients. Um, and those patients were randomized in a two-to-one fashion to either Adaptive CRT algorithm on or 
to the control group of ECHO, AV, and VV optimization. The primary endpoints in this study were Packer's clinical composite score and the aortic VTI. The study was powered for statistical non-inferiority, and that may be another thing that we will discuss during the question and answer period. The results of the, of the study were the following. If you compare the adaptive CRT arm with the control arm, we in fact demonstrated uh, with statistical significance that the, the adaptive CRT on was uh, statistically non-inferior. If you look at the, un, the patients in whom there was no change in function or in whom function worsened, there was a statistically non-significant difference between the uh, control group and the intervention arm. In this study, this, is a, 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 this graph basically, this figure shows the entire distribution of the percentage of LV-only pacing as it was experienced by each individual patient. On the left side in green, you can see patients all the way to the left where they were receiving LV pacing nearly 100% of the time. If you look all the way over to the right, those are patients that were receiving only by V pacing. Uh, in the middle are the patients that were receiving about 50% LV only pacing 50% of the time. So you can see that we have a very nice distribution in this study of a range of, of uh, percentage of LV only pacing. And in fact, if you look at that, if you look at the, the patients and, and look at the uh, endpoints according to percentage of pacing, we found that there was a significant increase in heart failure hospitalization and death associated uh, with, the, with LV only pacing less than 50% of the time. Additionally, LV only pacing was a multivariate predictor of all cause death and heart failure hospitalization to statistical significance in this study. Now, you could argue that this is just saying, well, the patients that are, are receiving less LV only pacing are sicker patients. That may be the case. Another way to ask the question is, well, how about comparing patients that have normal AV conduction in the control group with patients with normal AP conduction who are receiving LV only pacing. And basically what you can show is that at least by uh, hazard ratio analysis, there was a significant improvement, although we did not reach log rank uh, significance, there was a significant improvement by ha hazard ratio interpretation um, associated with LV only pacing greater than, uh, LV only pacing in patients with preserved AV conduction. So this is sort of comparing apples with apples. Uh, another way to look at this is that 80, uh, the patients that were in the um, intervention are, um, arm received uh, LV only pacing 73% 73 per, 73 of the time. So if you take your patients and they have normal AV conduction, you put uh, adaptive CRT on, you can expect that at least 73% of the time, roughly, they're going to be LV only paced. That LV only pacing was associated with an improved response relative to the patients who were re receiving just by V pacing. Another way to look at this is to compare this to historical controls. So we looked at adaptive CRT treatment, the treatment arm response, which was 74% improvement, compared with Prospect, InSync 3, Miracle ICD, and Miracle, we had a higher response rate associated with those patients in whom AV optimization was achieved via the adaptive CRT um, approach. If you compared the adaptive CRT arm with the echo arm compared to these historical controls, the adaptive CRT arm had a more robust response compared with the echo cardiographically driven patients. So to conclude, LV pacing synchronized with intrinsic RV activation can be better than biventricular pacing in patients with preserved AV conduction and normal sinus rhythm. Optimal fusion can be consistently achieved when LV pacing at approximately 70% of the intrinsic AV interval. If the AV delay gets prolonged or tachycardia is present, the algorithm reverts to adaptive biventricular pacing. The adaptive CRT tri trial demonstrated the safety and efficacy of the pacing algorithm compared to echo optimization and showed superior outcomes with synchronized LV pacing. That was a lot of information and hopefully the right amount of, the, the amount of time allotted to me. We are going to have more time to discuss and get into the details hopefully during the question and answer session. So this one's for uh, Dr. Bank. Um, what percentage of patients that you pace from the right ventricle actually develop heart failure? That's, that's a great question, and we really don't know the, the exact answer. There have been uh, some retrospective studies that have, have tried to look at this, and um, it's 
what I'll say is that it's probably more than 10 or 10 or 20 percent and probably less than 80 percent. But we don't know because there hasn't been a prospective uh, uh, study looking at that. I'm hoping maybe from some of the Block HF data that um, the Medtronic has, we might be able to, um, to get an idea of how many patients that are paced from the RV will eventually go on to develop worsening LV function. But the, the point is it's, uh, it's a significant problem. You need to look for it. And, um, and it happens in more patients than you think once you start looking for it. Yeah. So do you have any insight into which patients might be more likely? We, we've tried looking at that. We've looked at uh, RV septal versus RV apical pacing. We've looked at age. We've looked at other uh, factors in, and in about 50 or 60 patients uh, in our clinic, and we haven't been able to tease out any, um, any uh, predictive uh, variables for who's going to develop it and who isn't. So uh, there's been this issue about where should we pace from the right ventricle, and Dan, you want to come? I know you've been interested in this for a long time, whether <laughs> right ventricular septal pacing is better, his bundle pacing, or... Yeah, well, I, I think um, I, I've been making an argument for some time now that, that the only RV pacing that's, that's good is the, or let's put it this way, RV pacing is good in proportion to which you're capturing his Purkinje tissue. So, you know, there is a literature on, on septal pacing that indicates, you know, from time to time you get a really remarkably good response. Typically, that response associates with a very narrow QRS. That narrow QRS is not parallel conduction via ventricular myocyte spread. That's the fact that you're somewhere in the septum where you're capturing his, his tissue is, is mo what I think is the most likely scenario. Um, I, I think the bottom line is that if you're not capturing his, his fascicular tissue in, inside the RV, you're going to be creating a great deal of dysynchrony. And, you know, Dr. Bank raised a very interesting point. Is you're going to find this as hard as you look. So, you know, when you see all of your standard patients in, in pacemaker clinic and you, you ask them how they're doing, they're, oh, I'm doing great. But then you ask what they are doing. Um, you know, it's not unusual to find that their functional classification is, in, in fact, quite poor. Yeah. And my guess is that a lot of that functional compromise is due to RV pacing in those patients. This is for Dan. What is the adaptive uh, CRT pacing impact on longevity for the device? So, uh, so basically, if you're pacing LV only 50% of the time, that will enhance battery life by about six months. That's a good way to put it. Okay. And that's presumably because of the decrease in right ventricular Yeah, so, so the algorithm itself you, takes very little energy to actually do its thing, if you will. Um, you, the offset by avoiding RV pacing greatly outweighs the amount of energy it takes to run the algorithm. So you're saving energy by not RV pacing. Um, and there's a second one for you, uh, Dr. Lescarton. Uh, what are adaptive programmable, what are adaptive CRT programmable options? So uh, the out-of-the-box setting is by V adaptive. So in other words, if you want to put the, L the adaptive LV setting in your patient, you have to program it to LV adaptive, uh, uh, LVN by V adaptive. You can also opt to just go for standard bivy pacing if you wish. Um, I don't see what the point of that would be. The algorithm will determine, for example, that you know, if the patient goes into atrial fibrillation, it will automatically default to standard biventricular pacing. Um, so I don't really see why you wouldn't use the, the LV pacing only, I mean, the LV pacing in addition to bivy pacing, but you do have to program it. So again, Dr. Lescard, this is for you. Um, how is the AV interval set in the adaptive LV mode? Yeah, so, so I made mention of this uh, during the course of my talk, but, but basically you know, the, the idea is that um, in the LV pacing only, you want to avoid pacing during the, the P wave, and you want to get that, that peak response of, of AV optimization, which empirically has been demonstrated to be at about 70% of the sensed AV delay. So... Uh, so what it does, it does the measurement, A sense to V sense, and on the basis of that measurement, will pace LV only at 70% of that interval. May as well go on from what it will do when it, when it measures an AV interval in excess of 200 milliseconds. And so basically what it will then do is it goes into the bi V adaptive mode. And in that mode, during bi V pacing, there's a couple of things that are done. First of all, there's AV optimization which is based on the two assumptions that you want to pace at least 30 milliseconds after the end of the P wave. 
In essence, what you're allowing is left atrial activation before LV contraction. So you mandate that. It also mandates that, it paces, that the LV paces at least 50 mill, and, the, and the RV pace at least 50 milliseconds before the sensed onset of QRS, okay? thereby avoiding diastolic MR and, and that situation. Um, so uh, and it, in addition to that, then it also optimizes the LV, RV timing on the basis of QRS duration. And again, each of these parameters are things that have been demonstrated to have hemodynamic benefit um, relative to other settings. So, uh, so what it will do in the case of uh, VV timing is, first of all, it will not pre-excite the LV any more than 40 milliseconds. It will not pre-excite the RV any more than plus 20 milliseconds. And it chooses those parameters largely on the basis of QRS duration, which is measured by a filtered virtual electrogram uh, from the, the device to the coil on, on the defibrillation lead or the RA lead if there isn't a coil. So it takes a virtual surface electrogram, makes that measurement, and on the basis of QRS duration will either pre-excite the LV for narrower QRSs or pre-excite the RV for QRSs in excess of 160 milliseconds. So now I think I understand why when one of our refs was asked how it works, he said it works very well. <laughs> so, yeah, so hopefully that, I was attempting to clarify it. I don't know if I achieved that. <laughs> so the other thing that I, I know you've done some work on activation patterns, um, and I and to explain it, you've done some work demonstrating that the best fusion, the best resynchronization isn't with the narrowest QRS. So right. you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so... Um, the issue is that the, the size of the QRS is going to be dependent, dependent on a variety of factors. Uh, the critical issue is, is what Dr. Banks was showing in those incredibly beautiful images that he was showing of, of synchronization of, of the walls of the ventricles. That's not contingent on duration. That's contingent on timing of mechanical activation. So you need to optimize the, the uh, contraction of the walls so that you know, all the walls are coming in at the same time and the apex and the, the base are... are uh, squeezing towards one another as they would in a normal beat. Uh, so, in fact, QRS duration is not a good predictor. Now, that, that being said, if you have a very narrow QRS, well, you're probably, you know, the likelihood of response actually has been demonstrated quite well in, in uh, basically all the CRT trials, that if you have a narrow QRS, your likelihood of response is much higher. So, so you're getting good parallel conduction to the RV and LV, and it makes sense, but, but you do not need to demonstrate that for sure. Okay, so I think this is for me. What was the rationale for choosing non-inferiority as the end point to the study? Um, that's a, a, a good question. Um, the reason we did that was pretty simple, which is, one, we wanted the data to come out at the same time we brought out the device. Um, for so long, and since I've been in industry, the complaint has been, you guys bring stuff out, you expect us to want to use it, you have no proof that it works any better than what anybody else has, and. Uh, and you expect to sell the stuff. And uh, so we've taken that information to heart. And we've really tried, uh, certainly in the recent past, to bring forward studies that actually demonstrate the benefit at the same time we bring out the device. So the study had to be done in a certain time frame, which would allow us then to get the study completed and be able to uh, uh, present the results at the same time we brought the device out. So that's one reason. The other reason, of course, is at the time we started this study, um, we didn't want to compare it against nothing, so we wanted to use the best we thought we had at the time, and echo optimization was at that time the gold standard. Um, and I should say that, that this study was, we used a very rigorous echo optimization. I mean, this is a, a study that was done, you know, Dr. Gorskin designed the trial, and in fact, if you were in the trial, he didn't like the way you'd optimize the patient, he made you redo it. Okay. So it was excellent, which I think explains why both groups actually did better than the historical control. So again, it was for the reasons that we mentioned. It had to be a, a sizable size of a study that could be accomplished in the amount of time required. And then we also wanted to compare it against what was then the gold standard. All right. So thank you very much. I think it's You're time welcome. to end. Thank you all for joining us. It's been a great evening. Uh, good night.